everyone and uh, welcome back to the second session of the local church all right i hope you all had a good break all right um so let's let's uh, resume from where we left off uh from the bottom of page 60. uh but just to do a quick review of the previous point we just concluded uh, the last session by talking uh, about the three important uh, family practices in a local church three important family practices in a local church one is uh, we are encouraged to walk in brotherly love to care for one another uh, to be kind to one another uh, to put others uh, before ourselves etc the other one is to we are encouraged to uh, maintain the unity uh, and the fellowship of the spirit uh, within us in the church uh, to be proactive and uh, to to create a, a kingdom culture and and to cut out the gossip and the grumbling and the murmuring about one another uh, which can seem very uh, easy and then uh, we are all encouraged uh, to serve uh, one another to be available for one another and everybody every single person in the house of god um, has a role to play right every single one of them has a role to play right so from there we move on to uh, just more deeper uh, information on, uh, on on the local church and the family right so uh, in a family just like there there's a father mother son daughter uh, in the local church there are fathers mothers sons daughters etc right uh, we don't have a very clear uh, The information about the demographic uh you know in detail about uh people in the local church but however you you know in when you read uh john's um epistles uh we you see that he is addressing uh three sets of people uh, in specific and they're all mentioned at the bottom of page 60 in your notes it, um he's addressing little children um many many times and then you see young men uh, and then fathers as well in 1 John chapter 2 verse 13 and 14. Uh, so he's addressing these uh, three sets of people. That means there are, you know, there's, there is a, a certain demographic uh, in, in the church, in a local church, right? So we have, uh, just like uh, any other family, we have people with different, uh, in different age groups, in different ages and stages uh, in their life, a different maturity level, and they're, they're in a different level uh, in their walk with the Lord and whatnot. Similarly, in the local church, we also have people at different stages and ages of spiritual growth and maturity, right? That's why we have children's church, kids' church, or whatever you want to call it. Uh, youth ministry, young, uh, you know, young adults, women's ministry, men's ministry, etc., etc. Right? Um, and one of the things that we can keep in mind uh, is that uh, in the natural, right, uh, in the natural family, uh, we tend to be a little bit more lenient with children, with kids, isn't it? Uh, we tend to be more easygoing on them if they make a mistake or in their failures or shortcomings and whatnot. We are more tolerant to little children, right? We tend to overlook their mistakes and whatnot. So, uh, and as they grow, the ex your expectations uh, change. The way you expect them to conduct themselves uh, change, right? The way you expect them to behave themselves uh, also changes, isn't it? So, uh, and it's the same thing, you know, in in the spiritual house. Uh, in Galatians four one and two, let's read that very quickly. It says, "Now I say that uh, the heir." as long as he is a child, uh, does not differ at all from a slave, th uh, though he is a master of all, but is under guardians and stewards until the time appointed by the father. Right, So until he comes, he or she comes to that age of uh, maturity and, and, and understanding, uh, they are to be under the mentorship, under the leadership, under the stewardship um, of the elders and the leaders and you know uh, apostles uh, of the church. Right, um, so that's that's one of the things it's talking. It's addressing about once again about the maturity uh, of people and and those who are still growing in faith. Uh, you know, uh, are encouraged to be under under the leadership, under the stewardship of the elders and the leaders of the church. Um, right, and then we also see uh, the next section about a son mentality versus a servant 
mentality. Right? So in a family, like like we discussed, there's a father, mother, son, daughter, uh, etc. Right. So in the local church, uh, we are we are called sons and daughters of the living God, but then we can serve Him with two different mentalities. We can do all the work that we are doing uh, with the son mentality or a servant's mentality. Okay, uh, and uh, let's look at that in detail a little bit. So there is a big difference in how people relate to the local church, the house of God, depending on how they perceive themselves. Okay, can I read that section again? Right, there is a big difference in how people relate to the local church, which is the house of God, depending on how they perceive themselves. Right? Um, that means how they identify themselves as, oh, you know, depending on what their identity is. That's what it basically means, is isn't it? Like how they perceive themselves as. What is their identity? What is your identity? Are you strong uh, in your identity, knowing that you are a son and daughter of God, or are you looking at yourself as a servant? And so their identity uh, has more to do with how they relate with the local church, um, right? And I think that's very important because sometimes we can be too hard on ourselves as leaders, and you know, what can we do to make that better? And as much as you know, there are a lot of things that we can do to make build that relationship and rapport and whatnot. Uh, it's also important to know that it's a it's a two way traffic thing, right? this relationship is two ways not just one way it's very important to see how they perceive themselves okay so uh, some of them perceive themselves as uh, servants or sons so in john chapter 8 verse 35 it says and a slave does not abide in the house forever but a son abides forever right um so once again, just uh, in the above paragraph uh, about the in the in your notes in page sixty one, it says those who see themselves as belonging to the house of God, being a part of the local church family, have what we can call a son mentality. Those who do not have such a relationship with the local church family often carry uh, carry what we can call a servant mentality. And so let's look at those uh, three points uh, very briefly as to the differences between the son's mentality versus the servant mentality. And it all comes down to this one word called identity, right? The importance of uh, your identity, how strong is your identity and what you identify yourself as. Okay, first thing, a servant does work in the house for a reward, right? Uh, while a son does work in the house because he belongs. Now, in the last session, we spoke about uh, cleaning the house together as a family. Right? Uh, the first thing is we all do it because, uh, I mean, at least I did it because dad told me to do it. And if I didn't do it, I know what will happen to me. <laughs> uh, right? So, actually, there's no much, I don't know if it, it was like I didn't have an option. It's, it was beyond belonging. I didn't even get there yet. <laughs> but uh, you know, we did it because Dad told me to do it. We did it, and uh, but sometimes we would do it uh, because I knew there would be a reward. Also, it's like, hey, if you do this, then later, you know, when they come back from work in the evening, I get this. And so, <laughs> uh, I don't know if it's just me, guys, okay, or if uh, anyone else has been in that place, but. It's fun both ways, but then yeah, I mean, there's nothing wrong with the reward, is what I'm saying. But then, um, uh, you know, and then as you grow into maturity, you know, you do it because you belong, right? Uh, <clears throat> and the second one is, uh, Rosalind, I'll just I'll get to your question in just a minute, okay? I've seen your question, so I just finished. Let's finish this section. Yeah? Uh, the second point says a servant's commitment can change and can leave one house to work in another house. A son is firm in his commitment. He knows where he belongs. Right? And finally, a servant receives a reward. You see that? A servant receives a reward. 
for his or her work. But a son receives an inheritance because he belongs. That is deep, isn't it, guys? Right? That's uh, you know, it goes so much more deeper than a reward uh, is the inheritance. Okay, um, so yeah, very quickly to Rosalind's question. Uh, Rosalind, your question is, Pastor, if a member who is a young man is found guilty of something, can the church pastor, after several corrections, uh, tell him finally not to come to the church? Uh, is it right or wrong? Um, <laughs> uh, after, okay, so if a member of a church who is uh, guilty of something and after several corrections, um, tell him finally not to come to the church. It seems very, uh, I mean, without knowing what the guilt part is and going into the details of it, uh, I can't just say right or wrong. It's it's like asking me to define God and give three examples, Rosalind. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I don't know what to comment on it without knowing uh, the details of it because everything can be unique. I'm not asking you to give me the details. I'm just saying uh, I can't pass a verdict like that. But then, uh, hey, does anybody want to comment on that? Uh, and then I'll see if I can answer. Anybody who want to comment on Rosalind's question? If a member who is a young man Okay, so a member and is a young man is found guilty of something. Can the church pastor, after several corrections, I tell him finally not to come to the church? Is it right or wrong? Of course, then though, um, uh, if it is affecting other congregation, uh, I think it is okay to uh, uh, deny them to come to church. If it is not, then he can still come and be just a, a nothing that uh, is what my take is. Okay. Thanks, John. Anybody else? Yeah. Go ahead, Colin. Collins, go ahead. Yeah. You're on mute if you're talking. Collins, you raised your hand, right? Or was that by mistake? <laughs> okay, uh, anybody else want to comment on Rosalind's question? Yes, um, I think I share uh, John's view. If the 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 activity of the person or the 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 event or the act that is found guilty of is an act or event that can affect or continue to affect the rest of the congregation, mm -hmm. I think it is good to ask him to to stay back. But if it is personal, that is maybe character wise or whatever, who's a bit personal to him, they will continue to nurture him and to, to correct him because the God we are serving is a God who does not easily give up or doesn't give up on people. That's okay. my view. I, th I think I need to, I support John's view. Thanks, Isaac. Very wise. Thank you. Anybody else? Guys? Yes, go ahead. Pastor, I think when it comes to justice, uh, we must use our heads, not our hearts. What I mm. really mean, what I really mean is we have uh, laws as they were put forward in the Bible. When, uh, when a Christian makes a sin, what should we do? First, you call him in, pub, in private. And if he doesn't change, call him in front of two or three elders. Again, if he doesn't change, bring him forward in the congregation. And in case he doesn't change, 
uh, I, I, I read somewhere where they say that hand him over to Sutton. I think you need to disassociate with that kind of person. I'm sorry. <laughs> okay. Thank All you. right. Yeah, thank you. Thanks for sharing that. Okay. Anybody else? Anita, what would you do? Crazy, what would you do? I hope you're still in the class, but yeah. <laughs> it's a tricky question, isn't it? Uh, as in, um, without knowing what the scenario is, Rosalind. So, uh, I mean, like you, you've you been very clear in terms of uh, can the church, after several corrections. Um, um, so I'm assuming that uh, what this person has done has directly uh, affected uh, or has an impact on the church, um, right? So. Let's say if this person has been in an area of leadership or has been in or has been heading an important <clears throat> a volunteering uh, or leading uh, an important volunteering team or whatnot. Uh, you know, one of the first things that we would normally do is remove that person off that uh, of the leadership position. First thing, uh, you know, and then offer not just corrections, but uh, I would also say you know is there anything that we can do to help as well like you know offer uh, professional help you know if necessary i'm saying if necessary so you know keeping that in mind so counseling or you know whatnot um so if it's directly had an impact on the church um whatnot i think it's the first thing is to just take them give them a break from their leadership uh, position uh which is good for them and the people around them and then uh you know correct them uh, you give your counsel and then and as a leader um the, and as, a, as I, I think i was discussing with john or something uh as a pastor there's only so much that we can so much of counseling that we can give and we should give after a certain point you have to direct them to a professional uh help counseling which is very important you can't take on the full load uh, it's not going to be good on you in the long run. And now coming to the la latter part of your question is you kind of follow up in how they've been faring uh, in their progress and whatnot. So uh, in this, in my opinion, my humble opinion, I don't think I can uh, say to anyone, you stop coming to church and whatnot. I can't stop anyone from coming to church or, you know. Um, so that, that, that would be me, Rosalind. You know, you correct, you offer correction, you offer counsel, and you offer them help as well. Uh, you know, you, you even give them the contacts of the you know counselors that they can get in touch with. And yeah, cool. Yay, Roslyn agrees. Awesome. <laughs> hey, thanks, Roslyn. Uh, okay. Um, so yeah, coming back to uh, the sun mentality versus the servant mentality, uh, you know, the importance of it is just coming down to that single word called identity. Uh, I'm just reminded of uh, a story, okay? Uh, this is a story that uh, I would normally use when we are talking about generosity, uh, but then I think it comes in handy. So uh, the story goes like this, right? It's about, it's a story of Alexander the Great. Uh, and uh, you know, and his minister. So you know, Alexander the Great was just, uh, was come was riding on his horse coming out of his palace, and his minister was also al al along with him. And then there was a beggar, uh, you know, on the roadside asking for alms, you know, money. Uh, and uh, Alexander uh, responds in a ro uh, you know he's, he throws him several gold coins. Alexander, yeah, he throws him several gold coins, and to which uh, the minister, uh, you know, reacted by saying, uh, "Your Highness, uh, Your Majesty, you know, he's just a beggar, you know, why throw gold coins at him? Uh, normal copper coins would suffice." And the story goes, it, it says, uh, "I love it." It says, uh, "Alexander responded in a royal manner." He says. Uh, copper coins would uh, would suffice uh, the beggar's needs, 
but gold coins uh you know shows who i am uh you know and so that means alexander the great was generous because he knew his identity and who he was and that's why the story says he responded in a royal manner um and so knowing that our identity as sons and daughters of a living god uh it just it has a huge impact on how we do life with one another right how we respond to one another and to every situation you would end up responding in a royal manner when you know that you are the sons and daughters of of living of our living god right and some more characteristics uh, in page 62 we are in some of the characteristics of the sons and daughters in the house is first thing is a son will always demonstrate faithfulness right it's a, in the previous verse in john chapter 8 verse 35 i think uh, uh yeah uh a son will remain in the house right unlike the slave right he demonstrate faithfulness they are faithful to the family they stay aligned to the vision and direction given right in, in in everything that they do uh, they serve as sons and daughters they are like minded uh, like minded means uh, what what does it mean uh, they serve without obligation this is one one verse in philippians 2 19 to 22 i just want to read that one verse verse 20 it says for i have no one like minded who will sincerely care for your state now that we've read that let's read the previous verse and, and the verses after for us to understand the context it says but i trust in the lord jesus to send timothy to you shortly that i also may be encouraged when i know your state for i have no one like-minded who will sincerely care for your state that means paul is saying that hey timothy and i are like-minded we are in you we are in harmony we are united in spirit we are one right he also saying he is faithful just as I have been faithful, he is faithful. And then goes on to say in verse 21, For all seek their own, not the things which are of Christ Jesus. But you know his proven character, that as a son with his father, he served with me in the gospel. Wow, is this a beautiful testament, isn't it? Uh, of someone saying, something beautiful as this about another person right so like-minded means similar spirit uh, uh, so Timothy worked alongside Paul at Philippi to raise a church there and he served faithfully with Paul so much so that Paul could refer to him as being like-minded all right there's this um, verse in uh, Luke chapter 16, verse 12, I think. Luke chapter 16, verse 12. Can someone very quickly read that, please? Luke chapter 16, verse 12. And if yeah. you have not been trustworthy with someone else's property, who will give you property of your own? Okay, uh, which uh, version is that? Yeah, okay, thanks. Uh, anybody else? Uh, say, can you give you anything? Any other translations, please? Thanks for reading that, Jeffina. And if you have not been faithful in what is another's man, who will give you what is your own? Thank you, Anita. Yeah, so if you have not been faithful in another man's work, with another man's uh, ministry or whatnot, who will give to you your own, right? And so uh, coming back to this point, uh, we see that because Timothy was faithful with Paul's ministry, now we see that God is he's, he's being trusted with his own ministry of leading a church. Right? So being faithful uh, is uh, one of the huge characteristics of, of a son and a daughter, right? Um, and it goes a long way. And uh, we can talk about being faithful. You know, it's, it's a whole different topic for another day, but let's not talk about it now. Uh, 
in page uh, 63 it says just as every good father would lovingly correct his children uh, sons and daughters understand and receive correction as part of a nurturing process. A son or daughter of the house will be able to receive correction from the house without being offended. Okay, uh, goes a long way. A son or a daughter of the house will be able to receive correction from the house without being offended. Uh, you know, and that goes a long way. And if you uh, if if you haven't read the APC publication uh, offense, I would encourage you to do that. Okay. Uh, there's another interesting book uh, by uh, Bevio. Who's his, what's his first name? His last name is Bevio. Okay. Uh, I forget. It. Okay. Uh, he has a book called uh, Offense: Bait of Satan. And of pretty famous guy I forget I only know his last name Bevio child um, anyways okay uh, being able to receive correction uh, it, 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 it very important characteristic of a son and daughter right and that also tells that you need uh, you you will receive correction only if you are humble you need to be uh john Bavia. thanks Jeffina. right yeah. you need to be humble to receive correction right see guys i mean there are some times that we, you will be upset and whatnot when you know i have been upset with my dad when he's tried to say something or corrected and whatnot but you don't dwell on it isn't it you move on okay fine you receive the correction and then and you know you move on so uh scenarios like that will occur and um once again will reflect your maturity, your spiritual maturity, and how fast you're able to move on from that. Receive the correction, understand that it is for your good, uh, and that characteristic is demonstrated by a son and not a servant. Because a servant can move on. It's like, yeah, I don't like you, you know. <laughs> um, that's the other. And the, then the third part is uh, honoring fathers and mothers of the house. Uh, is another crucial thing. Uh, you know the story in Genesis 9, 18 to 27, where uh, Noah gets drunk with wine. Uh, you know, apparently Noah, uh, as as far as we know, we can tell that he's the one who, uh, maybe from his culture, knew how to make wine. Yeah, how to make wine? Is that right? How to brew? No, how to, yeah, wine. <laughs> so, you know the story, he gets drunk and uh, one of his son, uh, you know, um, ham sees him naked and he goes back he he is like uh he he laughs and he go tells his brothers about the, his estate um and and where has the other two sons of noah come like you know shem and jeff you can read the whole story uh they say they walk backwards they cover him and when noah noah realizes what has happened he blesses them with the father's blessings on shem and uh, Japheth. Uh, so genuine sons and daughters do not gossip, expose, or publicize genuine mistakes that have been made inside the house. On honest mistakes must be forgiven, forgotten, and covered. Continual sin. Now the word you see the change in words there: mistakes to sin, continual sin or habitual sin, of course must be exposed and judged. Right. So. Um, God is calling us to honor our leaders in the house of God. God is calling us to honor one another in the house of God uh, from that story there. And uh, <clears throat> I'm coming down, coming to the bottom of page 63. You see fathers and mothers in the house of God. Uh, so we're using the term um, fathering. Uh, it is in a gender independent way. Okay, it inc also includes mothering, right? Uh, God is the ultimate father and all fatherhood flows from him. Right? So Ephesians 3, uh, 14 and 15, it says, For this reason I bow my knees to the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. From whom the whole family, right? So once again, uh, he is the head. Right uh, of our family, of this spiritual house, of the spiritual family. Uh, we see that Paul had 
many spiritual sons and daughters. He referred to Timothy, Titus, and believers at Corinth, Galatia, Thessalonica, uh, and as his spiritual sons or children. It, uh, and all the references are given there. Uh, and, and the importance of their relationship. Because in the next very paragraph, when you read Malachi chapter 4, verse 5 and 6, uh, you know, it says that when the heart of the fathers is not towards the children, and when the heart of the children is not toward their fathers, that means when their relationship is not, when it is not as it's supposed to be, as God intended it to be, it says it opens doors to a curse. Uh, you know, in Malachi 4, chapter 4, 5 and 6 says, and he will return the heart of the fathers to the children and the hearts of the children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the earth with a curse. Right? So, uh, Perhaps many local churches experience this when there is strife between sons and daughters and between fathers and mothers. But once again, we are called to be united and strive to maintain the unity uh, amongst the relationship uh, in, in the church. Right. So some of the practical ways uh, we can be fathers and mothers where we nurture people and take them to spiritual maturity um, in page 64 is this one. Establish a personal relationship so that based on the relationship, we can speak into people's lives. Okay, establish personal relationship. Uh, you can ask yourself that question. Uh, are you establishing a personal relationship? So based on that a relationship, we can speak into people's lives. So you are building that, uh, not for the sake of building a relationship, you are building a relationship so that you can speak into their lives. Okay. Um, and second thing is go past having just a superficial surface level relationship to a place where we can lovingly correct, rebuke, discipline, and guide people. So as to instruct the inner man, bringing adjustment and alignment to the word of God. Right. So once again, going back to the first point uh, is reflecting the first point is you're building a relationship, not for the sake of building a relationship, but you're building a relationship to speak into their lives. And that means you are going deeper than a surface surface level uh, relationship. And how many of you realize that takes a lot of work? It takes a lot of blood, sweat and tears patience okay endurance all the fruits of the spirit has to come into play it's like lord why do i have to pursue this person <laughs> uh you know it's not easy isn't it building a relationship it, it takes uh it takes a lot uh, of you right uh, your time your emotions when I say emotions, everything is involved. Your joy, your happiness, your anger. Um, you know, you are, you can feel low. And there's a lot of investment that is happening uh, when you want to go beyond, a, uh, you know, a superficial surface level relationship. To go deeper, there's a lot that is expected of you, uh, right? A lot of sacrifice may be involved. So all of that to speak into the person's life. Uh, the third point is exercise a positive influence and hold people accountable exercise a positive influence and hold people accountable but a word influence is a very uh, popular word uh, in the circle or in the topic of leadership uh, right and so you know there were uh, there were a group of leaders that a panel of leaders that were put together and they were asked to define leadership in one word. And so uh, after quite a discussion, they narrowed it down to influence. Right? So you can, ha you can be a leader, as in you can have a position of a leader, uh, but the leadership is measured by how much of influence or what influence you're having on your team or who is having the influence on your team. Uh, so that means I don't have to be in a position of leadership to be influential. That could be good or bad. Okay, so exercise positive influence. 
um, and hold people accountable for their spiritual growth. You are holding them accountable because you are their shepherd, you are their leader, right? Uh, and I like this next point says, deal with the person's character more than the gifting. I want to say a big amen here, okay? Deal with the person's character more than gifting. So me as a leader or you as a leader, uh, deal when you're mentoring them and whatnot, when you're investing in their lives, uh, you know, this is deal with the person's character more. It doesn't say that don't deal with their giftings at all. You know, as you deal with them, their giftings, but just deal with their characters more. Why? Simply because some most of the times or sometimes a person can hide behind their giftings. <coughs> Stotram. Okay. <laughs> right? Um, uh, most of the time, uh, people can hide behind their gifting. So, uh, you know, keep investing in what are kingdom characteristics. Keep instilling them and reinstilling it uh, on them. Encourage people to press in for themselves. Uh, and we, you know, you should be at a point where that if you're mentoring a person, you should be absolutely okay with that person becoming a better person than you. That's what you should be striving at. But if that person grows more than you, whatever way, the only thing that you should feel for them is happiness and joy. Right? Uh, we, we, we should not be a Saul to a David. Where Saul's jealousy is what ruined his life. Right? Uh, I mean, guys, Jesus said, you will do greater thing than these. You know, <laughs> uh, it's our father just pushing us to be better people. And that's what we ought to be. Uh, and then finally, train people uh, for their God-appointed destiny and release them at the right time without any strings attached. Right? Uh, we as leaders, um, ministers of God, we ought to push them into the destiny that God has prepared for them. Right? Um, so those are some of the pointers um, uh, for us to keep in mind when we are when we are nurturing people, when we are investing in them, right? Uh, to take them from point A to point B in their journey uh, of spiritual maturity, right? Are you guys with me? Yes, no, maybe. Right. So those are all in line with uh, us as a family of God, a spiritual house. Uh, of God uh, and another thing that we are also called in becoming a family is developing community right a developing a, developing a sense of community right uh, here's a question for us uh, what's the difference between a community and a group What is the difference between a community and a group? Come on, guys. Talk to yeah. me. Yeah, in my in my opinion, they are like the same, but uh, the group is smaller entity and the community is a larger entity that's my own view so a group is an entity a community is a large entity yes that's what i think okay all right okay sure the difference can be the similarity depending on the context the difference can be the similarity the difference can be the similarity whoa depending on the context this this two words that naturally don't go together difference and similarity okay but depending on the context all right okay what else what else what else the difference between community and a group A 
for the difference, I think uh, the group is more uh, unified or maybe more tightened than the community is at large. A community is big that is at large. The group mm -hmm. can be more unifying than the community. That's my view. Okay. Yeah. Thanks, Isaac. Once again. Yeah. Anything else, John? Anything? Um, maybe a community has unity in the group, and the group is just a group. Okay, all right. So community has unity in the group. Yeah, it's part of the word. Anita, yes, go ahead, please. Okay. Community is a, a group of people having something in common, I think. Okay, they have something in common. All right. Yeah, thanks, Anita. Roslyn says community may be same bloodline like we belong to jesus bloodline groups are people of different bloodline this is what uh, came to my mind if i'm wrong ignore <laughs> there's no right or wrong answer guys okay just thanks thanks for voicing it out roslyn yeah thanks everybody for sharing yeah i think um so a group can i mean any anyone can make a group right it, 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 it could be temporary like oh. <laughs> I don't want to say WhatsApp group because that's the first thing that came to my mind, WhatsApp group. But uh, yeah, I mean, it could be a group or a temporary thing to finish something. But a uh, community, I think, yeah, like, uh, like what Anita was sharing, they have a, a they have a goal kind of a thing. They have an idea, like a, a vision or, or a mission. So uh, we are a community of so-and-so. We are here to do this. Uh, you know, they have a very clear uh, a focus line. Right. Um, so Zelatoli is saying community shares a set of common values, whereas a group may not. Yeah. Uh, a, yeah. A group can be a group for anything. You're just coming together for a temporary reason or do something and just move on in life types. But community shares a common set of values, isn't it? And uh, and here at the local church, we are encouraged, uh, you know, to to develop a sense of community. And uh, and of all the things that's mentioned there. Uh, what is important is that we develop a community that is christ centered okay because otherwise you know we're building a community and it can easily be uh, you know it can be lost in this in the name of getting together right you know like i said anybody can get together and do what not but but is your community christ centered Right, uh, and I would I encourage you to just go through those points, uh, you know, that's mentioned there, because everything that is mentioned above, uh, we see uh, it done in Acts chapter two, verse forty-four to forty-seven. Right, uh, it says, "Now all who believed were together and had all things in common, uh, and sold their positions and goods and divided them among all as anyone had needed." So continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God, having favor with all the people, and the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. Right? As they were building a sense of community, a Christ-centered uh, centered community, God kept adding people. Right? And they did everything together. Right? Some of the things that they did is they shared their resources. They met together for worship, prayer, and teaching. They ate food in each other's homes. They worshiped God uh, together at homes. They had favor with all people. Uh, they saw many people being added uh, you know, to the church as they were building community. But what community is not, is as what I mentioned, is not just coming together, uh, you know, having a get-together and you know we're having discussions about uh, i mean where where god is not the center of it where it's not about you know jesus anymore it's, it's just another get together and whatnot right so we should not meet in the name of christian fellowship to do things that are not appropriate for believers uh, for example as it says in ephesians chapter 5 verse 3 and 4 but fornication and all unclean, all uncleanness, uh, covetousness, let it not be named among you, as it as is fitting for saints. Neither filthiness nor foolish talking nor coarse jesting, 
which are not fitting but rather giving off thanks right um, most of the times uh, you know it is possible that we come together in the name of christian fellowship and end up doing everything that what we just read right um, so that is what not a christian community is and that should that is not what it should look like and and another thing is we can become very comfortable in that christian circle and say okay hey i love this this is what we are called to do and we can hide behind this you know christian community kind of get together thing and forget the need to go out and reach out to people for jesus christ right so uh in, in that you can it's not a substitute right okay you either you know you don't if you're doing this you don't have to do that you have to do this christian community is important um and having keeping that in mind it is also important for us to go out and you know evangelize and disciple people as well okay uh and and towards the final sections of uh this chapter in the beginning we saw that you know we are the house of god we are his household we are his spiritual house and then we see that he is the head of the house right like the head of any other house when we know that god is the head of the house when he's seeing when he sees certain things that are not right he does the cleaning okay he does the cleaning uh, first peter chapter 4 verse 17 says for the time has come for judgment to begin at the house of god judgment begins at the house of god okay um so you know he he begins uh cleaning things um so practical ways a local church can implement this is create a sense of belonging to the house of god the family of god the local church should be more than a place where people attend service it should become a family a place where we belong uh, encourage people to serve with the son mentality and not a servant mentality encourage fathers and mothers to nurture younger ones a develop true christian community and developing true christian community among ministry specific teams like ushering team worship team media team and others right um, it can become more team specific uh, build a sense of community uh, in the team that you are leading could be worship teams or media team ushering team and that happens um you know and uh this year you know we've uh, approved uh, that each team can go up they can have two outings a year I just you know to have that build team building activities or whatnot just have a time of fellowship and whatnot uh, right and all of this that once again you know builds a sense of community in the house of god a sense of family belonging um right some of the challenges to be prepared for not everyone who is part of the local church may see the need to be part of a spiritual family say i am an introvert you know i've had my fill two and a half hours is more than enough i my batteries are low i don't want anything extra to do i want to go back home and sleep it, it takes a lot of patience teaching and modeling right it takes a lot of patient teaching it's not just teaching it takes a lot <laughs> of patient teaching and does not just teaching but also modeling actions right to help people understand what it means to be the house of god and willing to be the family of god right? in a large church with a congregation of several hundreds um, perhaps thousands of people it is easy for people to feel disconnected lost and lonely so even if small groups are available, getting people connected to some small groups is a challenge. It's a challenge that we face at APC, um, right? It is possible for people to get lost easily because, I mean, even though we have all these life groups and whatnot, and we have all the contact list of all the first-time visitors who are attending the church, uh, getting them connected uh, to one of the small groups is a challenge uh, for various reasons, right? Uh, the danger of forming cliques or elite groups this is another challenge right uh, certain cultural groups 
with certain background will prefer to be with only their groups like of certain people from a certain region or a certain country would prefer hanging out with only that people uh you know so these groups may enjoy community within themselves but end up isolating themselves from a larger family are uh, doing more harm than good and all of this again once comes down to uh teaching uh investing nurturing uh you know instilling cultures values all of these things what we've just went through this whole chapter it can seem very basic and it you know some of the things that happens in our day-to-day -day lives in our families and whatnot it's the same thing that applies in the house of God. Okay, so um, I hope there was uh, something that you could take off from today's lessons, uh, lectures. Um, if any questions, you can also email it to me. Um, I'll be more, or you can put it in the stream section. I'll be more than happy to connect with you or respond to your questions in the in the stream section of the class. Okay, you guys, uh, lovely teaching you all. You guys take care. I'll uh, see you all once again next week. Have a lovely weekend. God bless you. Take care, guys. Bye. Thank you, Pastor. You're welcome, guys. Take care. Bye.